Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I don't have any announcements at the top, so uh, Mr. Letterman, would you like to get started? Thanks, Josh. Uh, let's talk about um, Nurse Nita Pham's visit to the White House sure. this afternoon. Um, seems like a pretty powerful image having her in the Oval Office really just hours after being discharged. Um, I assume this is designed to uh, uh, reassure people of the President's confidence that uh, that there's no danger to the public from people who are not symptomatic with Ebola? Uh, that certainly is a medical fact. That's what our experts tell us. Uh, I think this also should be a pretty apt reminder that um, that we do have the best medical infrastructure uh, in the world, and certainly a medical infrastructure that's in place to protect the American public, and uh, and the track record of treating Ebola patients in this country is uh, is very strong, particularly for those uh, who are um, uh, you know who are quickly diagnosed uh, and admitted through the system. So uh, this is a a testament today to uh, a young woman who, uh, over the course of doing her job and treating for an Ebola patient, uh, got sick. Uh, and she was doing the work that many nurses do on a daily basis, and she did so, um, uh, yeah, even though it did, it, it did put her at some uh, personal risk. And what she did uh, didn't, um, she didn't do it because she was promised a raise. She didn't do it because it was glamorous. Uh, she did it because she's committed to her profession, and she was committed to treating an individual who was sick. Uh, and she was prepared to use her training to try to meet that person's needs. Uh, so the fact that she um, uh, has been treated and released, uh, I think, is a terrific news and I think answers the prayers of many people across the country today. What can you tell us about the federal government's response to the diagnosis of an Ebola patient in New York City? Well, uh, I can tell you a couple of things about that. Uh, we certainly um, are pleased that so much of the planning that has been done in recent days uh, has uh, proved to be very useful. Uh, as you know, um, there are, there, as earlier this week, uh, medical professionals conducted a training for healthcare workers uh, at the Javits Center in New York to ensure that they had all of the training uh, that they needed to understand what was necessary to treat an Ebola patient uh, in a way that was safe for them and safe for the broader community. Uh, that certainly is, uh, looks like prudent planning in hindsight. Uh, the other thing that has been underway for some time is the President had designated uh, five airports uh, where individuals who are traveling from West Africa uh, could enter the country. Uh, by funneling these passengers to those five airports, we were able to marshal the appropriate resources that were necessary to, to apply an additional layer of screening for those individuals who had traveled recently in West Africa. Uh, that, in conjunction with that, uh, state and local officials had worked to identify hospitals uh, in the same region as each of these, as of each of these airports where patients who are sick could be directed. So uh, Bellevue Hospital in New York w was the hospital that had been identified uh, as the hospital where patients who, uh, or were passengers who were detected uh, with a higher fever or were otherwise sick uh, would be sent as they're coming off the airplane. So uh, Bellevue is a place where uh, significant planning uh, had already been done uh, to ensure that protocols were in place to treat Ebola patients. I understand that Bellevue had been designated by, both by the state and the city uh, as one of eight medical facilities in the state of New York that was prepared to treat Ebola patients. Uh, so a lot of training and planning uh, went into that. Uh, in fact, I also understand that when uh, Dr. Spencer was admitted to Bellevue Hospital yesterday. There actually happened to be a team of CDC experts already at the hospital uh, evaluating that hospital and making sure that they were up to uh, the needed standards to treat an Ebola patient. Um, consistent with the order that the President gave uh, last week for CDC to uh, organize a SWAT team of CDC experts to rapidly deploy to a hospital where an Ebola patient had identified, uh, I'm told that this SWAT team actually arrived in New York last night. Uh, the same evening that this individual uh, was a confirmed Ebola patient, uh, we had experts on the ground in New York uh, working side by side with hospital administrators and healthcare professionals at Bellevue Hospital uh, to ensure that the strengthened protocols that the CDC announced earlier this week uh, were in place so that this individual could get a, a high quality treatment and that that treatment could be administered in a way uh, that the risk to uh, healthcare workers was not significantly elevated. You talked about uh, Bellevue being be one of these designated hospitals to treat Ebola. Uh, would you like every state to designate hospitals, particularly to treat Ebola? 
Well, uh, this is, I think is an indication of the solid preparation uh, that was put in place by state and local officials. Governor Cuomo and Mayor de Blasio, I think, deserve a lot of credit uh, for the effort that they um, put into ensuring that New York was prepared to deal with a situation like this. Um, we certainly value the strong working relationship that already exists between uh, federal uh, officials and medical experts in the federal government uh, and state and local officials across the country. That, uh, that working relationship has been important. It will continue to be important uh, as, we, uh, as we deal with this situation. Uh, so far, uh, you know, what we have worked with state officials to do is to ensure, as I mentioned earlier, that hospitals uh, are uh, in the region, in the same region as the airports where individuals traveling from West Africa are arriving in this country, uh, that those hospitals are prepared uh, and have the training and information uh, and equipment that they need to receive uh, patients that may be, uh, that may be that may test positive for Ebola. So uh, that is uh, the kind of uh, uh, detailed planning that's been done. Uh, what you've also seen is the CDC offer up uh, strengthened guidance to healthcare workers and uh, public health officials all across the country to uh, give them guidance about what they should do to prepare to, to treat an Ebola patient. Uh, that all said, you know, we continue to believe to this day that, uh, and when I say we, I mean our medical experts, continue to believe to this day that the risk of an e a widespread Ebola outbreak in the United States uh, continues to be exceedingly low. And uh, Dr. Fauci this morning said that a uh, mandatory quarantine for people returning from the Ebola um, hot zone in West Africa uh, it was something that's under very active discussion. Can you tell us a little bit about those discussions and what that might look like? Well, I can tell you that the, the protocols that uh, guide uh, the the restrictions that are placed on individuals that are returning from West Africa uh, are driven by the best scientific advice that we can get. Uh, we have our medical experts and our scientists looking carefully uh, at how we treat Ebola patients and how we can do that in a way that protects uh, the American public and in a way that protects uh, healthcare workers who are rendering life-saving aid. So we're going to continue to rely on that advice uh, as we regularly update and review procedures as necessary uh, to protect the American public. Uh, it, you, you'll recall that one of the strengthened measures that was announced just this week uh, was the intention of CDC to share uh, contact information with state and local officials so that state and local officials uh, could take the necessary steps to protect the public uh, when it comes to individuals who have uh, return to the U.S. after having recently traveled in West Africa. So that's an example of the kind of beefed up uh, procedures that, uh, that the CDC has put in place uh, to ensure that we're doing everything we can to protect the American public. And briefly, on the President's uh, plans next week to campaign uh, really across the country for some Democratic candidates for governor. Um, despite this, um, this push at the end for governors, uh, the President um, only did one fundraiser this year for the, uh, the Democratic Governors Association. I think it was back in, in February, and really the focus of his fundraising has been for House and Senate. Uh, I'm wondering if, if governor's races are so important to the president, to the party this year, uh, why didn't he do more earlier in the year to, uh, to help raise money for them? Well, uh, as you point out, Josh, the president ha has done a number of things to uh, boost the candidacy of Democratic candidates up and down the ballot all across the country. Uh, and the president has worked to, uh, to try to boost the candidacy of uh, Democratic governors who are running for re-election or candidates uh, for governor who are Democrats. Um, the, uh, in terms of the, our, our, the exact fundraising strategy that's deployed by the DGA, uh, I'd refer you to them about what sort of requests uh, they made. Um, you know, I, I frankly don't have off the top of my head about whether or not the President signed emails uh, to uh, help raise money uh, via the Internet for uh, candidates for governor. I can tell you that certainly Democratic candidates, uh, like others, benefit from the kinds of resources that the President raised for the Democratic National Committee. Uh, we have the party working very aggressively to benefit uh, Democrats up and down the ballot, and uh, that's one way in which uh, they will benefit from the, the President's uh, involvement. Uh, but we also anticipate that the events that the President will be hosting uh, over the course of next week will also uh, significantly benefit those campaigns as well. Okay. Roberta? So does the administration um, feel that the post-arrival monitoring that the CD and CDC announced earlier this week is enough? Or how much thought is being given to people also needing to agree to stay in some kind of self-isolation or self-quarantine once they arrive back from the hot zone? Well, we do anticipate that uh, we do expect that these uh, active monitoring procedures that are in place for 
uh, individuals who have recently traveled in West Africa, uh, will be in place on Monday. Uh, so those, uh, those measures are being ramped up. Uh, but we do continue to have confidence, uh, as I believe Mayor de Blasio and the Public Health Commissioner in New York stated yesterday, uh, that the risk facing uh, the people of New York continues to be exceedingly low. Uh, that we understand from uh, reports that subway traffic today uh, was uh, typical for a Friday. Uh, I think that's an indication that the people of New York are feeling confident, uh, as they should, uh, about their safety as they go about uh, their daily business. Uh, they should because uh, Dr. Spencer, as we discussed, uh, is somebody who, upon return from West Africa, uh, was screened at the airport. And when he was screened at the airport, it's determined that he did not have a temperature. Uh, and that's significant because we know that the only way that you can contract Ebola is by coming into contact with the bodily fluids of an individual who is exhibiting symptoms of Ebola. Uh, Dr. Spencer, when he flew on the plane, did not have any symptoms uh, of Ebola. Uh, that's why we're not concerned at all about the risk uh, facing uh, people who may have been on that airplane. Uh, since he returned, uh, Dr. Spencer was regularly taking his temperature and monitoring his health. Uh, and as soon as it became clear that his temperature was elevated, he contacted uh, medical authorities. Uh, he, these were medical authorities who, as I mentioned to Josh, had recently been trained uh, in the protocols that are necessary to uh, detect and isolate an Ebola patient. So those medical authorities responded promptly uh, in accordance with protocols. He was transferred to Bellevue Hospital, a, a hospital that had been preparing for weeks to receive a possible Ebola patient. Uh, he was appropriately isolated, uh, and he uh, started uh, receiving treatment uh, while he was being tested for the Ebola virus. So uh, this is an indication uh, that uh, this kind of planning and prep pre preparation uh, will be very important to the successful treatment uh, of Ebola patients uh, and the continued safety of uh, the people of, of America, and in this case, the people of New York City. Right, so he did all those things as he laid out, but what he didn't do, it seems that he didn't self-isolate. He went out into the community um, to the limited degree that we've all been reading about. So is that something that the administration is considering requiring people who have come back to do, to self-isolate, to stay indoors or stay in their homes or some additional measure? Well, you know, we're always reviewing and, uh, and assessing uh, the protocols that are in place. Uh, but the fact of the matter is, uh, you know, the CDC is doing uh, the necessary contact tracing. Uh, but our experts tell us uh, that, uh, and as a result of that contact tracing, I think that there are a couple of people that have been uh, isolated. But the fact is that the risk facing the average New Yorker uh, is exceedingly low. And the reason for that is that uh, this is an individual who was monitoring his health very closely. and. Again, what we know about Ebola is, the, is very clearly about the way that it's transmitted. It's only transmitted when an individual comes in close contact with the bodily fluids of an individual who has symptoms of Ebola. That is why I think it is instructive for people to take note of the fact that we only have uh, two instances where the Ebola virus has been transmitted inside the United States. Uh, and those are instances where you had healthcare workers who were treating a very sick Ebola patient. Uh, and uh, that obviously is very different uh, than the kind of day-to-day -day encounters uh, that people have as they go about their business in public. So that is why the risk uh, that is facing the people of New York and the people of America uh, continues at this point to be exceedingly low, uh, according to our medical experts. Just briefly, um, is the administration considering requiring people who have been in the hot zone to complete a quarantine before coming back to America? Well, I'm not going to get into the sort of the ongoing deliberations of, uh, uh, of our public health professionals. Uh, what I can tell you is that these kinds of policy decisions are going to be driven uh, by science uh, and by the best advice of our medical experts uh, and by the, our scientists that have four decades of experience uh, in dealing with uh, Ebola outbreaks in West Africa. So we've got uh, teams on the ground uh, at Bellevue Hospital that have uh, experience in infection control, uh, that have experience uh, in limiting infection control inside medical facilities. These are individuals that have an expertise in treating the Ebola virus. Uh, we're going to make sure that they are taking the necessary steps that they can treat uh, Dr. Spencer uh, in a way that will um, uh, protect the public and the healthcare workers who are uh, rendering him aid. Okay? Olivier. Josh, one, one question, one housekeeping item. The question is when someone who has beaten Ebola comes to see the President in the Oval Office, are there additional layers of 
precautions taken? Do they undergo, is there a White House overseeing medical checkup to double, to, just to make sure that they're in fact clear of this? No. Uh, the doctor, as Dr. Fauci uh, noted in his news conference that I caught part of earlier today, uh, the, uh, uh, Ms. Pham uh, was tested five different times to confirm that she uh, no longer had the virus. Uh, so uh, all the necessary testing that uh, allows her to uh, safely return home with a clean bill of health uh, is uh, the same uh, 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 guidance that she has gotten uh, in terms of meeting the President. And then the housekeeping item, I'd like to ask the, the White House through you to uh, open the 130 event. Obviously, I think we're getting very close now. Uh, open this event to the full complement of print, television, and, and radio reporters who would typically cover an event like this. Right. You know, uh, in this case, we're just going to do uh, the, the still photographers. And why? I mean, is it out of concern for, for, for her? It, it sort of, it does, to me, it seems like it reduces the, the magnitude of this event a little bit. Not, nothing against our still brethren, obviously. Right, right. Uh, I think in this case, we determined that, uh, that the still photographers would uh, provide the access that was necessary to ensure that uh, you and the American people were uh, informed about this event. So, okay. Juliet. I know you can't get into you know great details about the policy deliberations on quarantining, re returning medical personnel, but can you talk about some of the balancing act that you're trying to do when you're looking at, for example, whether a quarantine upon return to the United States would affect the ongoing international effort to stop Ebola at its source? Could you just, there's a lot of concern among folks that between the you know cut in commercial traffic, changes in insurance policies, and something like this, that there aren't, it's, made, it's becoming more difficult to get volunteers to go to the region? Well, Juliet, you, uh, as usual, raise a really uh, important point, which is uh, Dr. Spencer is somebody who, as I alluded to earlier, uh, volunteered his time to treat people with Ebola in West Africa. Uh, doesn't ex exactly sound like a luxurious vacation, uh, but this is somebody who was prepared to use uh, his skills as a doctor to try to meet the needs of those who are far less fortunate than we are. Uh, and that is a, I think, um, a pretty astounding uh, display of generosity uh, and charity and goodwill. Uh, it certainly is, reflects the spirit of the American people uh, that we are willing to selflessly uh, try to meet the needs of those who are less fortunate. Uh, at the same time, it's not just charity, though, because we know that the only way that we can entirely eliminate the risk to the American people from the Ebola virus is to stop this outbreak at the source. And in order to stop, the, stop this outbreak at the source in West Africa, we're going to need to surge uh, personnel and supplies uh, to stop this outbreak. And uh, you know, so we are certainly appreciative of what Dr. Spencer uh, has done, not because it respects, not, not only because uh, it reflects the true spirit of America, but also it reflects uh, the commitment that's required to stop this Ebola outbreak at the source. Um, and I guess, uh, to answer your question more directly, we do want to ensure that whatever policies we put in place uh, takes as the first priority the protection of the American public. But at the same time, we don't want to um, overly burden those individuals who uh, are going to great lengths to try to serve their, their fellow man uh, and stop this outbreak at the source, which ultimately is in the best interest of the American people. Julie. Um, can you tell us a little bit about how this visit came together? Um, what, did the president invite her, or how, how it came to fruition, and, and sort of what uh, what was the impetus for that? And then also separately, I'm sure you're aware there's a hearing on the Hill today where um, the administration's response to Ebola has come under some third degree of criticism. So can you tell us what um, Ron Plain has been doing and will be doing in the days to come um, to sort of uh, get that into a, a better place and, and respond to some of the criticism that you've been getting that the response has been inadequate? Uh, well, let's first talk about the, uh, the visit of Nina Pham today. The, uh, the White House learned uh, early today that she was uh, going to be released from the, the National Institutes of Health, a medical facility that had been treating her for the last week or so. Uh, of course, the, the NIH is just a, uh, a few miles from here from the White House, and White House officials contacted the NIH to let uh, her know that the president was interested in meeting her uh, if she felt up to it. Uh, we were certainly pleased to see that she uh, accepted the invitation, and I look forward to her arrival here at the White House shortly. Uh, as it relates to the hearing today, I didn't see uh, much of it. Uh, it 
it does seem that most of the criticism was uh, was uh, registered by uh, somebody who struggled to pronounce the name of the virus at the hearing. So um, I think uh, we might not um, be too concerned about some of the partisan criticism that was on display, I think, in the hearing. But uh, there was representation from the administration at the hearing. Uh, it does reflect our commitment to working with Congress to ensure that uh, the country is working together and pulling in the same direction to respond to this situation. Uh, and we'll continue to do that in the days ahead. Ron Klain doing? Can you tell us anything about what, how he'll be spending his time? I know he's supposed to, to go to Atlanta to see CDC next week. Yeah. What else is he doing? Uh, today is his third day on the job, so I'm pleased that there's been a, a lot of interest uh, in the work that he's doing here. Uh, he is somebody who has uh, been convening meetings and regularly uh, working closely with officials at the CDC and HHS uh, as they put in place some of the protocols that have been uh, announced over the course of this week. Uh, he also was in touch with New York officials uh, last night uh, and over the course of today uh, to ensure that the state and local officials were feeling uh, the kind of support that they're uh, receiving from uh, the Obama administration as they deal with uh, this uh, latest uh, Ebola case. Um, he is planning to travel to Atlanta uh, next week where he'll have the opportunity to uh, meet in person with some of the CDC officials that he's been on the phone with a lot uh, over the course of the last few days. So, John. Uh, Josh, can you give some details on the SWAT team that the, the was sent to New York last night? How many people, yeah. you know, what exactly they're doing? Uh, I don't have uh, specific details about the members of the SWAT team. I know as a general matter, when they are members of the SWAT team who are assembled are individuals who typically have an expertise in the area of uh, infection control in hospitals. It typically will include individuals who uh, have dealt with Ebola patients in the past. Uh, there has also been uh, talk about the importance of uh, individuals who can be um, closely monitoring healthcare workers as they're donning and doffing personal protection equipment. Uh, there also is, uh, has been the designation in these circumstances of a site manager, somebody who can be in charge of ensuring uh, that the protocols uh, are very closely followed. Uh, those are the kinds of people that are typically part of a SWAT team. Uh, and so I'd refer you to CDC about uh, how many individuals and which individuals fit the profile that I just described. Uh, I can give you a little bit more color on one other aspect of this, which is that uh, there was, uh, uh, in, in order to uh, quickly transport the team from the CDC to New York, uh, the President ordered that, uh, Department of Defense, that a Department of Defense aircraft be commissioned uh, to uh, fly them from Atlanta uh, to New York so they could be in place as soon as possible. Uh, I do understand that weather um, briefly delayed their arrival uh, because there was a pretty bad storm in New York last night. but. Um, it is because of, uh, you know, we were able to draw on some DOD resources and because uh, this team was prepared uh, that they were on the ground within hours, just a couple hours, of this individual being uh, testing positive for Ebola. And I think that indicates uh, the kind of commitment that CDC has to taking very seriously uh, the responsibilities of acting quickly to support local uh, health care professionals when they're dealing with an Ebola patient. So how soon after news of the confirmation that that individual in New York had Ebola did the President make that order? <coughs> I don't have the exact TikTok uh, of all of this. I know that there was a, because of his travel history and because of uh, his close contact with Ebola patients in West Africa, there was a strong suspicion uh, that he would test positive for Ebola. So I think that some of the wheels were put into motion a little earlier than they otherwise would have been uh, because of the, the specifics of this individual case. And, and I know you haven't wanted to comment on the specific uh, plans, whether or not you'll considering quarantine, forcing a quarantine here in the United States or before folks travel. Um, but as a general matter, does news of the fact that we have another case of Ebola, this time in New York, uh, indicate that something more needs to be done, that more steps need to be put in place? Uh, I think the answer to that is not necessarily, uh, because we continue to believe uh, that the risk uh, facing New Yorkers from the Ebola virus today continues to be exceedingly low. Uh, there are a small number of individuals who did have close contact with Dr. Spencer upon his return from West Africa who have been isolated. But for the average New Yorker who's riding the subway today or taking a stroll uh, along the High Line, presuming the weather there is better than it was yesterday, uh, those individuals do not face uh, uh, a significantly elevated risk uh, in this situation. And the reason is, and, and this is important, uh, the reason is that Dr. Spencer was very closely monitoring his own health. Uh, and as soon as he noticed uh, that he might be sh displaying symptoms that are consistent with Ebola. He contacted healthcare professionals who were trained uh, and prepared to respond quickly, and that's exactly what they did. 
The president wouldn't have any qualms about riding the subway today in New York or going bowling at the uh, bowling alley or. The president is a big fan of bowling. Uh, yeah, he's we all know. So he, he is an accomplished, he's an accomplished bowler. Uh, the <laughs> you've been practicing. Um, I can tell you that the president would have no qualms uh, about riding the subway in New York or taking a stroll on the High Line, which is, I know is something that he would love to do, um, or even uh, you know bowling a few frames at the, at this bowling alley in Brooklyn. The, the risk of uh, that, that is facing the average New Yorker, the average person uh, going to those places uh, remains today uh, exceedingly low. And, and can you just, uh, just one more time, the, I mean, th this, is, this is quite an extraordinary event. Uh, the, the Nina Pham's just been released, just been cleared of Ebola, and then she's coming right here to the Oval Office. Uh, wh what is the significance, the symbolic significance of the President's meeting today with Nina Pham? Mm -hmm. Well, I think it is uh, an opportunity for the president to, first of all, to thank her for her uh, service. Uh, again, this is an individual, this is a nurse who used her training uh, to treat uh, somebody who was really sick with Ebola. Uh, and she dove in to treat this individual um, you know, without regard for her own health. Uh, this is somebody who, um, she didn't get a raise because she did it. Uh, she didn't, certainly didn't do it for the glory. Uh, there are a lot of uh, individuals who, who treated uh, that first Ebola patient in Dallas uh, who we don't know about. Uh, so this is somebody who displayed the kind of uh, selfless service to her fellow man uh, that I think is worthy of uh, some praise. Uh, at the same time, we're also uh, certainly relieved uh, that she uh, has been successfully treated and has recovered uh, from Ebola. That's, uh, uh, I think that reflects, as I mentioned earlier, that the, the prayers of countless Americans have, uh, have been answered today. So we're certainly celebrating al alongside her, and the President's looking forward to meeting her. Just to follow up lastly on, on what he, Olivier was asking you about, um, I mean, this is an important meeting. Why ban reporters from this meeting? Why ban video cameras? I mean, countless other events in the Oval Office, and there are this President, other Presidents, you know, there are reporters present, there are video, there, there are television cameras present. Why? Does this White House decide on a meeting this important to say no, reporters are not allowed at this event? Why? Uh, the good news is that reporters will be allowed at the event. Uh, the uh, photo, your colleagues, the photojournalists, uh, will be in there to, to take a photograph you know of the president greeting. There, there, there are no print reporters allowed. There are no television reporters allowed. There's no editorial presence. You're only allowing still photographers. Yeah. Uh, well, uh, many of you uh, did have the opportunity to, uh, to see her deliver remarks at the NIH upon her uh, uh, upon her uh, departure from the hospital, uh, so you know that. Uh, That's not an answer to my question. I mean, why, why, why was this decision made? Because, uh, uh, because uh, uh, reporters did have the opportunity to see her speak already, uh, and this is an opportunity for the president to greet her at the White House, and we did want to make sure the photographers could see her uh, do so. But, um, but you know, the president nor uh, Ms. Pham plans to make in, uh, any comments today. So, Laura. Yeah, just to uh, follow up on uh, what did you. Uh, this gentleman is saying, could you have a foreign camera? This is a worldwide story. This is a huge symbol for all of us. I mean, American press or foreign press to see the president welcoming here this nurse. Mm -hmm. um, yes, why? Yeah. Well, That's the first question. It's certainly good news, and I, and I do understand that there will be uh, wire photographers that will be uh, in the Oval Office taking this picture. And that image will be uh, will be beamed will be beamed around the world. Video thing. I mean, for people in Africa at this moment, it would be quite important to see this footage of the president welcoming this woman. Uh, and the good news is that they will see a, a photograph of the president greeting this woman in the Oval Office. So it'll be a, a really nice event, I think. My second question is: Was the president brief on the attack in New York against the police officers yesterday? Uh, the after? president was informed uh, of that situation by his uh, by Lisa Monaco last night. And what's the White House reaction? Uh, this is a, uh, a situation that is uh, under investigation by the New York Police Department, local law enforcement authorities. Uh, officials here at the White House and other federal law enforcement officials have been in touch with uh, local law enforcement on this matter, uh, but it's still under investigation, so I don't have too much to say about it at this point. Ed? Josh, uh, I wanted to um, go back to Ebola. Okay. You've said several times Dr. Spencer was monitoring himself very closely. Why was a doctor who just came from treating Ebola patients in West Africa allowed to monitor himself as opposed to having the government keep a closer eye on whether or not he was getting sick? She, he is a uh, highly trained medical professional, uh, certainly had the capacity to take his own temperature, 
Uh, he had been advised by the government about he'd been he'd been advised uh, by the government about what steps he should take uh, should uh, he notice uh, that symptoms like a high fever or at least an elevated fever uh, were uh, evident, uh, and he followed those steps. And uh, because of the preparation of uh, uh, state and local officials in New York, uh, he's been uh, he's receiving treatment the already. Told the public again and again, we don't need a travel ban because we have these very tough restrictions in place, which include taking people's temperatures when they come in, right? And so we did that, and he didn't have a temperature at that point. That's Doesn't correct. that suggest there is a gap there in the system? There is not a gap in the system, Ed, and it goes back to. Uh, the fact that the only way that an individual can contract the uh, Ebola virus is by coming into close contact with the bodily fluids of an individual who is already displaying symptoms of Ebola. Uh, you can't catch Ebola uh, by uh, through the air. You can't catch Ebola by drinking food or drinking water or eating the food. Earlier, I guess I'm not trying to raise a question about the people on the plane. You made that point earlier. I get that, but I'm saying there's somebody who was interacting with people who had Ebola. <laughs> in West Africa. So we knew he was high risk for this. And he did heroic work trying to help those people. Well, uh, I, he but was not high risk uh, for this, Ed. It's, it's important for people to understand well, that there are... There, he was a doctor there, treating Ebola yeah, patients. Yeah, there are dozens of healthcare workers who have treated Ebola patients in West Africa uh, and did that without contracting the Ebola virus. A He's at a higher risk than you or An I elevated risk, but not a high risk. And it's okay. important for people to understand that. So the then the why isn't he stopped from coming to America until we know for sure he does not have Ebola, mm -hmm. since he was interacting with people and treating people who had Ebola? Uh, again, he was, uh, he was somebody who was screened before he returned to the United States. He was screen screened in West Africa before he boarded an aircraft. Uh, and he was screened upon arrival in the United States. Uh, in both indications, uh, or in both situations, uh, he did not uh, exhibit any symptoms of Ebola. Uh, that means that he was not at all contagious. So anybody who was flying on the plane, anybody who happened to be in the airport uh, at the same time that he was there, uh, does not face, later. face I, I any risk. I understand your point. I'm just saying, but then okay. he still got Ebola later okay. and went out. We don't know whether he infected anyone or else. Hopefully he did not. But the right. point is, he got through there because he was not showing symptoms. Doesn't that suggest Correct. that you can't catch everyone on their way in because they might not be showing symptoms? But what it shows is it shows that people can't catch Ebola unless they come into the close contact with the bodily fluids of somebody who's already displaying symptoms of Ebola. And because he, shortly after he started displaying symptoms of Ebola, he contacted public health officials who safely transported him to a hospital where he was isolated uh, and where he, was being, where he started treatment. Uh, and that is an indication uh, that the, uh, the American people and the people of New York City uh, do not face a significant risk from this situation. Okay, I want to go on to another subject. Uh, the conservative group Judicial Watch uh, has just put out a statement yesterday, I believe, saying when the president months ago invoked executive privilege on Fast and Furious, um, it included 20 emails between the attorney general, his wife, and his mother. And I was wondering, did, did the attorney general talk about this sensitive gun running operation with his wife? And his mother, and that, and that's why you had to invoke executive privilege. Well, and I'd, I'd refer you to the Department of Justice well, about it about this. It was justice privilege. It was executive privilege. It was invoked by the president, not the attorney general. Right. right? But, but uh, I can tell you that it's the Department of Justice that can discuss uh, the uh, those emails with you. What I will, what is clear, uh, is that uh, the uh, this lawsuit that has been filed by uh, Judicial Watch uh, actually doesn't have anything to do with the actual Fast and Furious operation. Uh, it has to do with uh, emails and documents related to the operation. Uh, more than 7,500 pages of those documents have already been turned over uh, to Congress, which has obviously thoroughly reviewed uh, this uh, situation, and they've, done count they've conducted countless interviews. Uh, the Inspector General has mm -hmm. as well. This is something that has been uh, thoroughly uh, investigated. But if there was nothing sensitive in the emails that the Attorney General sent to his wife and mom, presumably they could have been turned over. Well, uh, I know that, uh, again, 7,500 pages of documents uh, were turned over both to the Inspector General as well as to uh, Democrats and Republicans in Congress who are investigating this issue. So uh, we have demonstrated, I think, a pretty clear commitment to uh, a legitimate oversight on this matter and others. Okay, last one on ISIS. Um, there were reports that the, the administration is investigating allegations that there have been chlorine attacks um, by ISIS on the ground uh, in the Middle East. Can you tell us whether that's been in Iraq? Was it also in Syria? And how concerned you, are you that these terrorists are also using chemical weapons? Well, Ed, uh, we are, uh, we've seen those reports and we're continuing to investigating, uh, continuing to investigate them. Um, we obviously, as, we've, as we have in the past, uh, are, take seriously allegations of chemical weapons use. Uh, and so we'll have uh, staff 
uh, on the ground uh, and other places to analyze uh, what exactly happened and try to get to the bottom of these reports. But I'm not in a position to confirm them at this point. Okay. Kristen. Josh, just to follow up, if they are true, how would it change the equation in Iraq? I'm well, uh, we're going we're gonna to investigate those reports. Uh, I've seen them, but I don't ha have any comment on it beyond saying that we're looking into them. Would it potentially change the, the U.S. strategy? Well, we're going we're gonna to re we're gonna review those, uh, those reports before we draw any conclusions. And during the hearing today, several doctors um, said to Congressman Issa when he asked if there's a larger overall failure when it comes to being prepared to fight infectious disease, several doctors said yes. So my question is, are there steps being taken beyond Ebola to tighten the system to make sure that the U.S. Is, is prepared for these types of eventualities? Well, there obviously have been a lot of steps that have been taken already to ensure that we are doing uh, everything we can to protect the American public. Uh, and there has been a significant commitment by this administration, uh, even before this latest Ebola outbreak in West Africa, to ensure that we're, do we're taking the necessary steps uh, here in the U.S., but also around the world, to try to protect uh, the American people from, uh, from diseases like this. Uh, you know, what we are uh, typically concerned about are, are situations uh, that uh, exist in countries like those in West Africa that don't have a modern medical infrastructure. Uh, and the ability of, a, of, a, of, a, of an outbreak of a contagious virus is something that we've been focused on uh, for quite some time. And I know this was actually the focus of attention in the previous administration as well. Uh, I'll tell you that as recently as September, uh, the United States convened a major global event um, to garner international uh, commitments and resources for the global health security agenda. Uh, so this is something that has uh, uh, drawn the attention of uh, the Obama administration and medical professionals here in this country. Uh, even before the headlines were filled with uh, reports of Ebola. So just to be clear, I mean, do you, does the administration disagree with what those doctors are saying? Do you have confidence right now? I, I haven't seen the specific testimony of those, uh, of those individuals, but I, uh, what, what, I, uh, what I can confirm for you and what is evident from uh, anybody who takes a close look at the track record here uh, is that the United States, uh, at, under the leadership of this president, uh, has been focused on ensuring uh, we're doing what we can to protect the American public uh, from diseases um, that may uh, uh, that may uh, you know, break out uh, anywhere in the world. I want to take one more try at this question that I know you've gotten a number of different ways, but Congressman Jason Chaffetz said today, you can't have someone who's had direct contact with Ebola patients and allow them to go bowling. Isn't there, do you agree that on some level there is a problem with that, that that exposes a gap in the system? Well, I think uh, the I think the problem is exposed uh, may be related to Mr. Chaffetz's knowledge of actually, of actually how uh, Ebola is transmitted. Patients, uh, though. He was. Uh, so, but it sounds like um, I should go through this again. The only way that you can contract Ebola is by coming into the close contact uh, with the bodily fluids of an individual who is displaying symptoms of Ebola. And I understand what you're saying, Josh, but now so. there are two other people who are in quarantine because this individual can and again, it's not to place blame on him at all, mm -hmm. but because this individual was obviously exposed to the disease and then came back here. Well, here's, let's, uh, let me try to answer this a slightly different way, which is to present an illustration. There are only two known instances in which the Ebola virus has been transmitted inside the United States. Uh, and those were to two healthcare workers in Dallas uh, who were treating uh, a patient who was very sick with Ebola. Uh, these are ostensibly uh, individuals who, uh, because of their commitment to serving uh, this individual and because of their commitment to their profession, probably came into close contact with the bodily fluids of this uh, individual who was very sick with Ebola. Um, the exact details uh, or the exact circumstances that were in place that uh, allowed them to contract the disease is still under investigation, but uh, we know why they were at a higher risk. Uh, I think what should, people should understand is the people who um, who were in Mr. Duncan's family and living with him, even after he was sick with Ebola, uh, recently were uh, cleared from monitoring because they had, um, uh, it had been more than 21 days since they'd last been in, in contact with him. So that is an indication of just uh, of the circumstances under which uh, someone can contract Ebola. Uh, the fact is that Dr. Spencer was somebody who was closely monitoring his health. And at the first indication that he might have the symptoms of Ebola, uh, therefore, at the first indication that he might at all be even the slightest bit contagious with Ebola, he contacted healthcare professionals uh, who responded quickly to his uh, residence, uh, and they transported him uh, under existing strengthened protocols to the hospital that was prepared to receive him, 
they quickly isolated him and uh, began giving him treatment. So uh, again, I, I'm not sure if there are people who, for whatever reason, think that it might be in their interest one way or another to try to agitate uh, or provoke uh, anxiety among the American people. Uh, but I would strongly encourage uh, anybody who is uh, concerned about this situation uh, to focus on the facts and to focus on exactly what we know uh, about how this virus is transmitted, about how uh, limited the circumstances have been where individuals who have contracted Ebola in this country. Uh, it's also important for people to understand that there are circumstances where people did appear to be at an elevated risk of contracting Ebola, but they didn't. Uh, and I think that that is a, a useful illustration that people should keep in mind uh, if they're uh, concerned uh, about how this disease is transmitted. And I guess uh, that's advice I wouldn't just share to average Americans. I'd even uh, share it with uh, politicians on Capitol Hill as well. So, Mr. Plant. You said a moment ago that the reason the President wanted to see Nurse Pham was to thank her for her service. Mm -hmm. That being the case, wouldn't you want to have him do that in front of a television camera so that the rest of the country could see it? I think in this case, in order to, to uh, offer his gratitude, the President wanted to do that in person with Ms. With Ms. Pham, uh, and that's what he'll do in the Oval Office. Let me ask you this. Was there a White House TV camera in that meeting? Uh, I don't know. The meeting has taken place since I walked out here, um, so if I don't know. If there was, would you then put that on the net? Uh, if you're interested in it, we can work with you about it. No, to, I'm interested together. in knowing why, if you do, you make it available well, we by can, passing us. We can engage in this uh, hypothetical discussion uh, after the briefing and after I've determined whether or not there is a television camera in the room. Well, let me ask you about the nuclear deal. There's a report that the White House is pushing a particular deal with Iran with the, uh, with the rest of the P5 plus one in order to get something done by the deadline at the end of next month. What can you tell me about that? Well, uh, discussions continue to be underway between uh, the, I guess, among the members of the P5 plus one uh, and uh, Iranian representatives uh, about steps that can be taken to resolve the international community's concerns about Iran's nuclear program. But are we pushing a particular solution, we the U.S.? Well, uh, generally speaking, we're pushing a solution that would uh, allow the international community to have clear insight uh, into uh, the Iran's ability to resolve everybody's concerns about their nuclear program. Uh, in terms of the details of that agreement, I'm, I'm not going to get into that from here. Uh, this is something that obviously is being uh, discussed uh, in a very detailed fashion by uh, the United States, our P5 plus one partners, and the representatives of, uh, of Iran. So, okay. Justin. Um, I wanted to ask about the President's meeting this afternoon uh, on ISIS over at the State Department. I guess my first question is why he's going to the State Department, especially since he's, according to the guidance you guys have given us, he's meeting with his National Security Council, which he routinely meets with here. Uh, he typically does meet with them here. Uh, you'll recall that just a week or two ago the President convened a National Security Council meeting uh, at the Pentagon uh, to discuss these issues. Uh, the Pentagon obviously has a very important role uh, in our strategy to uh, degrade and ultimately destroy ISIL. Uh, the State Department also has an important role in terms of, of working uh, through our diplomatic channels to build this broad international coalition in support of this broader effort. So uh, the President is going to convene the meeting there. I, I think the, the meeting will, um, will uh, sort of run the gamut uh, of all of the elements of the strategy that's been put in place, but we'll have a read out, read out of that meeting at, uh, when it concludes. Anticipate him giving diplomats their guidance on this meeting that's coming up in Kuwait on uh, kind of combating extremism, extremist extremism, and and sort of internet recruitment of people, especially in, in light of what's been going on. Uh, uh, I, I, the uh, I'm not aware of the of the specific meeting uh, in Kuwait that you're referring to, but the you know there are there are a lot of elements to our strategy. Certainly, uh, stopping the flow of foreign fighters is an important part. Uh, of that strategy. Uh, I don't know whether it's on the agenda for this meeting, but we'll try to get your readout afterwards, and uh, if it's discussed, we'll try to let you know. And then one last thing on a totally different topic, but Politico had a story yesterday that said Dennis McDonough was asking uh, top staff members to uh, say whether or not they'd stay through the remainder of the President's term uh, after <coughs> midterms. Uh, I was wondering if that's true, if that's a conversation you've had with him, or that you're aware that other staff members have had with him. Uh, it's not a conversation that I have had with him. Uh, I can't speak to all the conversations that senior staffers have had uh, with the Chief of Staff, but I don't know of any, um, you know, any regimented uh, schedule of uh, conversations that the Chief of Staff is planning to have. Okay. Stephen. Today in Israel and now here in the U.S. as well, that the uh, administration rejected uh, the 
suggestion or the ask of a meeting between the Israeli Defense Minister and the Vice President and the Secretary of State that it was punitive. Do you have any comment on these reports? Mm -hmm. uh, I've seen I've seen those reports. The I do understand that the Israeli Defense Minister met with his uh, American counterpart, uh, our Secretary of Defense Chuck Hagel. Uh, I can't speak to any of the meetings that uh, I can. So I can speak to the meeting that did occur, and I understand the Department of Defense. Uh, put out a readout of that meeting. Uh, I can't speak to any meetings that didn't occur. Do you know if it's true that the U.S. that the White House rejected the ask for these meetings with the Vice President and the National Security Advisor? Uh, like I said, I, I'm not aware of. Uh, I don't have much information to share with you about meetings that did not occur. Uh, I do know that there was uh, a meeting that did that occurred between the uh, Secretary of Defense Chuck Hagel and his Israeli counterpart. Uh, as you know, the United States values the strong uh, security relationship that we have uh, with Israel. Uh, it is arguably uh, as strong as with Israel as anybody else. Uh, and so those kinds of meetings between uh, the Israeli Secretary of Defense and his American counterpart uh, are obviously uh, an important priority. Uh, they take place pretty frequently. And, uh, but uh, you, can get a, you, you can contact the Department of Defense for a readout of that meeting. Okay. Jim. Uh, if I can just be a contrarian for, for one moment about the President's meeting with Nurse Pham. Is it a good idea for the President to meet with Nurse Pham, given the fact that she just got out of a specialized hospital uh, and being treated for Ebola? She is uh, somebody who has tested uh, negative five times for the Ebola virus. The, her doctors, who are some of the foremost experts uh, in the field, uh, have confirmed that she is virus free. Uh, and no risk to the president whatsoever. Uh, no, and in fact, I think the I think the only question that people had was whether or not she would be uh, up for making the trip down here to the White House and and. Uh, uh, and we were pleased to, to, uh, to see on television that she looked very healthy when she was delivering her statement and pleased that she accepted the invitation of the President. And according to uh, the print photographers who, who went inside the President's meeting with Nurse Pham, uh, the President did hug uh, Nurse Pham. And uh, I mean, is that, should he maybe just hold off on that a little bit? Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> I mean, just, to, just to be cautious, he is the President. Yes, he is the president, and he was, was not at all concerned uh, about any risk that he would be associated with him, uh, showing his gratitude to her by hugging her. And getting back to Dr. Spencer, um, his case does it not uh, present in a sort of a, an interesting discussion about personal responsibility? Because he came back, he was taking his temperature, he was monitoring his own health conditions and so forth. But, I mean, I think it could be argued that not every doctor would be as diligent coming back from West Africa, and that perhaps some doctors might take more risks than others. Aren't you sort of leaving it up to the personal responsibility of each, each and every healthcare worker who comes back from West Africa to do the right thing, to make sure that you don't have uh, exposures uh, like what could have happened in New York and, and may potentially still happen? Well, I would just posit, Jim, that uh, individuals who have spent time in West Africa certainly understand the seriousness of this disease. Uh, and I think that they would uh, take seriously their responsibility uh, to uh, ensure that, uh, that they didn't, weren't responsible for transmitting it to others uh, intentionally. And so uh, I think it's not at all surprising that somebody like Dr. Spencer, who is so uh, dedicated to stopping the spread of this disease, that he'd be monitoring his own health very closely, which apparently he was. Uh, and it's also not at all surprising that somebody who was so steeped in the details of the treatment of this disease uh, that he would respond in the appropriate way once it became clear that he was uh, experiencing an elevated uh, body temperature. Uh, and he did contact uh, the uh, medical professionals uh, in New York who were trained uh, and ready to deal with this particular situation. We were pleased that he was uh, transported so quickly to the hospital and isolated uh, and began re re receiving treatment quite early. And there's been some discussion about whether or not an Ebola vaccine has been developed quickly enough. And I know Dr. Fauci talked about that earlier today down at the NIH. Uh, has the President uh, mentioned it at all as a priority to uh, the people meeting in these uh, uh, Ebola gatherings that you've had here at the White House? Uh, is, is Ron Klain you know, prodding uh, the scientists who are developing this vaccine to get things moving? Uh, is the President prodding people to get this, get this moving? Well, I, again, I, a lot of these kinds of decisions are driven by science, and there obviously is a sense of urgency associated with dealing with uh, this Ebola outbreak in West Africa. And again, the only way that we can entirely eliminate the risk to the American people from the Ebola virus is to stop this outbreak at the source. Uh, and certainly a vaccine could play a key role uh, in doing exactly that. Uh, as a general matter, I can tell you that the President has, uh, uh, on countless occasions, uh, spoken about the value of medical research in this country. 
uh, both the value in terms of, uh, of enhancing the safety of the American people, but also the value in uh, strengthening our economy, uh, that these kinds of that this kind of research often leads to important innovations that can be very good for our economy, uh, can lead to uh, elements of job creation. And we have um, been disappointed uh, that, uh, that some Republicans in Congress haven't shared uh, the President's uh, commitment uh, to this kind of issue that would be good for uh, the American people, but also good for our economy. Okay? Josh. Move on. Jim? Uh, Josh, how does our current system protect us from a psychopath coming from Africa who would, who would want to do us harm, who would want to infect people. Because it sounds like somebody who is infected could pass through into the United States and then develop the fever uh, later. How do we stop those people? Yeah. Well, uh, we stop them in a, in a couple of ways. One is we certainly do uh, have in place screening measures at the airport, both uh, in West Africa and in the United States, to ensure uh, that individuals who have recently traveled in West Africa uh, are are, do not have symptoms of Ebola. Uh, you'll recall that just earlier this week, the CDC uh, announced a regimen for the active monitoring of all travelers who've recently been in West Africa. Uh, what the CDC will do is they will share information with state and local public health authorities so that those authorities have the information that they need to monitor the health of those individuals who've recently traveled to West Africa. Uh, and that certainly would uh, account for uh, what I think is probably even the far-fetched uh, 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 hypothetical scenario that you've laid out. Okay. Uh, Chris, I'll give you the last one, then we'll do the week ahead. Thanks, Josh. Um, after the U.S. Supreme Court last year struck down the Defense of Marriage Act, uh, the administration worked to extend the federal benefits of marriage to same-sex couples to, uh, to a great extent uh, throughout the country, regardless of the state in which these couples live. The exception of that is the Social Security and Veterans Benefits. The Justice Department has shown that it cannot grant those benefits to couples living in non-marriage equality states. But now there are some LGBT advocates who say that, uh, that those benefits can be extended. And there's been uh, multiple lawsuits, including one filed this week, to compel the administration to do so. And Senator Dianne Feinstein herself wrote a letter to the President saying that those benefits should be extended. Is there any consideration in the White House to making a policy change to extend those uh, Social Security and Veterans benefits? Uh, I have to admit, Chris, I'm not steeped in the details of this uh, particular case, or as, particularly as it relates to this lawsuit. Uh, so I'd refer you to the Department of Justice that may be able to share some more information for you on that. Okay. So let's do the week ahead. Uh, on Monday, the President will meet with the Advanced Manufacturing Partnership Steering Committee at the White House. Uh, on Tuesday, the President will travel Sorry, to... What, what committee is that? This is the Advanced Manufacturing Partnership Steering Committee. Uh, we'll have some more details. Uh, 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 this is a steering committee that's interested in partnering on issues related to advanced manufacturing. <laughs> thanks for the guidance. Oh, thanks. <laughs> please, uh, please tip your waitresses on the way out. Uh. Uh, on Tuesday, the President will travel to Milwaukee, Wisconsin, to attend a DNC roundtable and a campaign event for Mary Burke uh, and other Wisconsin Democrats. Uh, as you may know, uh, Ms. Burke is running for governor in the state of Wisconsin. Uh, further details about the President's trip to Wisconsin uh, will be made available over the weekend. Uh, on Wednesday, the President will be here at the White House uh, and will attend in some meetings. Uh, on Thursday, the President will travel to uh, beautiful Portland, Maine, to attend a DNC roundtable and a campaign event for Mike Mishu. Uh, and other Maine Democrats. Uh, Mr. Mishu, as you guys all know, is a Democratic congressman from Maine uh, who's running for governor there. Uh, additional details about the trip to Maine uh, will be available soon. Uh, after uh, those activities in Maine, the President will travel to Providence, Rhode Island, uh, where he'll remain overnight. Uh, on Friday, the President will wake up in Providence, Rhode Island, uh, and deliver remarks at Rhode Island College. Uh, his remarks will focus on the economy and the importance of pursuing policies that help women succeed. Uh, additional details about the Rhode Island trip will be available in the coming days as well. Uh, the President will return to Friday, or will return to the White House uh, on Friday uh, after that event. And then in the evening, the President and the First Lady will welcome local children and children of military families to a trick or treat uh, on the south portico of the White House. I know that's something that uh, a lot of people are looking forward to. Uh, on Saturday, we got some additional details about the President's uh, activities next weekend. So this is next Saturday. The President will travel to Detroit, Michigan, or the Detroit, Michigan area, to attend a campaign event for Gary Peters and Mark Schauer. Uh, additional details on the President's travel to Michigan uh, will be available soon. Uh, obviously, uh, Mr. Peters is a candidate for the Senate, and Mr. Schauer is a candidate for governor in Michigan. Uh, on Sunday, the President will travel to Bridgeport, Connecticut, uh, for an event with Dan Malloy and other Connecticut Democrats. 
Uh, Mr. Malloy is the sitting governor of, of Connecticut, and he's running for re-election. Uh, you'll recall that this was a trip that was originally scheduled for last week, uh, but was rescheduled for uh, next weekend. Uh, after that event in Connecticut, the president will travel to Philadelphia to attend a campaign event for Tom Wolf uh, and other Pennsylvania Democrats. Uh, Mr. Wolf is, of course, the Democratic candidate for governor uh, in Pennsylvania. We'll have additional details about uh, next Sunday's travel to Connecticut in Pennsylvania available soon. So, um, is also a uh, yes, this is uh, uh, that's a good point, Scott. The uh, the president's uh, event in uh, in Rhode Island on Friday uh, is. Uh, uh, a rescheduled from uh, the event that had to be canceled last week. This okay. is the most he's been campaigning since uh, re-elect. Uh, yeah, so that, that's probably a fair assessment. Uh, yeah, it's probably a, a, a pretty good one. You're pretty psyched so. about it. <laughs> <laughs> psyched, I think, is the actually the, pre the the word the president used. So we're looking forward to it next week, and uh, hopefully you all be able to join us as we travel. So have a good weekend, everybody. Exactly. Thanks, Josh.